This episode of the This Is Reportage podcast is sponsored by PickTime. It's a new year, and I know a lot of us use this time to analyse the systems and software we have. And if you're not using PickTime, then I urge you to check them out. I've been using them for my galleries and more recently slideshows for years. And if you've heard the podcast before, you'll know I've raved about them even before they became a sponsor. Really professional looking galleries, incredibly easy to customize, great sales automation tools that mean I can run discounts and sales, the ability for clients to design and create their own albums, inbuilt slideshows and a team behind it that are always adding new features such as blog integration, chat GPT functionality and more. Head to pick-time.com to find out more. There's a free 30-day trial and new users can also get one bonus month when upgrading to any paid plan with the code ThisIsReportage. Hi and welcome to episode 137 of the This Is Reportage podcast. My name is Alan Law, I'm the founder of This Reportage and This Reportage family, and I'm a photographer too. Awesome to be kicking off 2024 with the one and only Jay Doherty. If you've never met or heard from Jay before, you're in for a treat, as not only is he a fantastic photographer, but he's also one of the world's loveliest humans. I don't think it's possible to listen to Jay without a huge smile on your face. Jay shares so much on the episode today, including how skateboarding influenced his wedding photography career, a certain song he listens to before every wedding, his personal project called Wedding Grannies, the time he got stuck in the toilet at a bride's house, creating Learning to Fly, the wedding photography retreat, the story behind his motorbike reportage award, why he backs up his images as soon as he can, becoming a yoga teacher and the many benefits it can bring, why he was late to his own wedding, the importance of work-life balance, and so much more. Before we get on to Jay, just a few things from me. Um, Firstly, is it too late to say Happy New Year? I think it's acceptable for the first couple of weeks of January, so I'm going to say it anyway. Hope you had a lovely holiday period. This episode was actually recorded a few months ago, back at the end of July, so I'm really sorry for the delay in getting it live. Numerous reasons, which I don't want to bore you all with, but yeah, sorry Jay, and sorry that we might talk about things in the episodes that are a bit out of date now. One of those is that at the time of the interview, we didn't know if Jay would be speaking at Doc Day again, but the fab news is, he is! Over 160 tickets have already been sold to Doc Day, which is the documentary wedding photography conference founded by TIR members Annie and Kevin Kafash. It's always a fantastic event and I can't wait for this year's. It's on February 20th, 2024 in Dublin, Ireland, and you can still grab grab one of the last tickets at docday.international. Or there's a link to Doc Day from the TIR website too. TIR members also get an exclusive discount. Check the members area for the discount code. And not only is Jay speaking again, but he's also leading another sea swim the day before, which you would not find me at in a million years. I don't even swim in the sea, in Cornwall, in the summer, ever. (laughs) Um, As you'll hear in the episode, Jay also runs his own wedding photography retreat each year, Learning to Fly, which I've only ever heard fab things about. Tickets are available for the next one in October 2024. Head to learningtofly.ie to grab yours. Finally, it's a whole new awards year on both this reportage and this reportage family. You have the best chance to make our top 100 photographers in the world and top storytellers list if you enter the first collection. The deadline is 2359 GMT on the 24th of January 2024. So just a few days away now. All the best if you're submitting. Right, finally, over to Jay. Hey Jay, how you doing? Hello Alan, what is the crack, sir? I I am all good over here in not so sunny Cornland. How about you uh, up where you are? Grand, all good here. Finally, we talk. I was waiting by the phone for months and months, <laughs> and the wife was reassuring me, he'll call, he'll call. And he did. <laughs> the call is here, and you said yes, it's all great. <laughs> it's all great. <laughs> yeah, what, um, how, th- how things are with you? Because you, you're in like the very north, never eat shredded, shredded wheat, northwest of Ireland, aren't you? Yeah, northwest of Donegal in a peninsula called Inishowen in Muff Village. And it's a a beautiful part of the world, very rough and rugged, and the weather is always fairly hectic, but uh, I guess we're kind of living the dream up here. It sounds romantic. I would imagine it's similar to Cornwall. We were in Cornwall about five years ago, and it's the same kind of geography or topography and same uh, same kind of weather systems, only a wee bit more hectic here. But uh, 
you learn to work with it and it's uh the dream is here somewhere if you dig deep well that's cool you sound you always sound happy man and i guess part of that is from your surroundings and where you live have you always uh, always been in that part of ireland i grew up in northern ireland which is as the crow flies is about one mile from here so we're right on the border and about 15 years ago we moved to the republic just due to just due to housing and uh and finding a cool place to live okay. and we always we spent our years surfing here in donegal so it's kind of like a second home for me anyway that's cool isn't it absolutely freezing to be surfing in those waters well <laughs> it is pretty crazy but we've got grand wetsuits but maybe 25 years ago we were out in like no sleeved wetsuits wearing your vans and uh that was properly cold but now we're uh we're fairly cozy even in january or february it's not too bad okay that's good you know i've only i've only tried a wetsuit once and it was my mother-in-law's wetsuit and it was one of those as you <laughs> say, <laughs> and it was one of those that, as you say without like proper full arms and stuff and i just like froze it was awful it was awful yeah. Uh, but I yeah, would just... say you would look quite the treat in a wetsuit. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think there's any photographic proof that I was in no. that. But yeah. Did um, when you came to Cornwall, did you surf down here? We um, no, we went skateboarding. It was my friend's fortieth birthday, so that was six or seven years ago, and um, we just visited the local wee spots. We stayed in. Truro was a Truro, I think. Oh yeah, and, I live five minutes from Truro. Right? Oh, cool. grand! And we went to Lands End, and it pissed down. We were oh, there dear. for like four days in August, and and it rained nearly all the time. And we were like, right. "Sure, we should have got this at home." Oh yeah, I apologise. I apologise for the Cornish uh, weather. <laughs> part, part of the world, man. I'm uh, I'm slightly envious because I can imagine it can only be a beautiful place to call your home. Wow, it sounds as beautiful where you are, though, as well. So, yeah, that's cool. Do you know what? I've never been to Land's End, though. Even though I live in Cornwall, I've never been to Land's End. Hmm. That's right. Yeah. We, ca- so. we kind of got there, and it was like it was like £10 in each, so we just kind of sat in the car park and then fucked off home. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. That's funny. Did you do a lot of skateboarding then down here? Are there, like, skate parks around here and stuff? Or you Aye, just... there's Penzance. Is that near you? Uh, it's um, about 40 minutes away, yeah something in Truro and um, uh, there's a fair few good concrete facilities. It's a good part of the world for a, to be a skateboarder. Oh, that's cool. I never knew that. I Oh man, I I tried getting on a skateboard when I was about 11 and then Julie fell uh, off straight away and yeah, oh, I just, not for me. How about you? Have you been doing it since a kid then? Since I was 14 and I am now 46. So that's uh, 32 years served and um it's good, plenty of broken bones, but it's taught me plenty, and it's been a probably the the best community spirit I can imagine. It's a, just a great thing, especially when we're kind of trying to. We've always had it open for children. Listen, be a part of this, and my son does. He goes on the scooter, and my daughter's pretty good in the roller skates, and my wife's pretty good at the skateboarding. So. Uh, it's a great thing to be part of. It's uh, it offers so much, plenty of uh, plenty of friendships and and creativity. It's a real creative kind of community to be a part of. That's cool. That's very cool. Yeah, the broken bones. What what have you broken? Broken plenty. I've broken my wrist about six or seven times, um, both is ankles. That, oh man, has the, has the wrist ever happened like during wedding season? I about. Four years ago, I broke my wrist in August, so oh. I had to photograph maybe 10 weddings in a cast, but um, <laughs> it was grand. I'll tell you something funny about that, because back then I was using a Nikon 70 to 200, which is so heavy, and I was using my cast as a sort of stabilizing <laughs> mechanism, and it was great. I was like, this is working a treat, like a, like a kind of marksman. That's funny. That's funny, man. Well, do you know what? I've never. I'm touching wood now. I've never broken a bone. Maybe that means I live a really sedentary, boring life. But I've never broken. <laughs> well, it's overrated. Don't be worrying. <laughs> okay, that's funny. Um, cool, Jay. This is it's, it's really fun already. Let's go. Let's go back in time. Let's go back a bit. And on on your website, you say you um 
started your artis- artistic career as a writer for magazines, your own poems and short stories, something that you still love to do now when life allows. So, yeah. Can you tell us more about that and, you know, your general, how you got into wedding photography? I'll go back to skateboarding. And that was, that kind of connects with making videos and taking photographs and writing articles and making your own kind of fanzines. So it all kind of started there. And I was originally a kind of video maker and a writer for magazines because photography was just too difficult. It was kind of back in the film days. Mm. And um, from that day, I kind of eventually got into digital photography and learned learned off camera flash as standard, which is kind of, I find it fairly easy and simple now because as a skateboard photographer, you, you have to use two flashes in an outdoor environment most of the time. So that kind of lent, lent itself to, to weddings very handy. That's um, and I always kind of wrote for magazines and made our own magazines and we had a few wee skateboard clothing companies and stuff. And I uh, got a few pictures and mags and a few kind of cover photos. And somehow a friend of mine, uncle was getting married. It was his second wedding. They were having like a, a home wedding and going to the church. And he asked, did he know any photographers? And he said, me. And I had no, like probably like most wedding photographers, had no idea that that's something you would even be interested in. So I did that, got 100 quid. It was fairly middling stroke crap. But, uh, <laughs> and then that, I guess the journey began from just that random occurrence. Was that on film or, or digital? No, that was like a Nikon D70 which uh-huh. was like 16 years ago. And did you did you use some of your off-camera flash knowledge at that first wedding? I did, surely. I did it for the evening when the bride and groom were, were cutting their cake. And I kind of, I think I remember I had everyone surrounding them and then the flash was lighting them up. So uh, that stuff was fairly standard in skateboarding. So, um, But I was scared shitless of actually being close to people and asking them maybe to do things or you know when you're in the chapel for the first time thinking is the priest going to just throw me out the door so I was standing <laughs> in the corner with a you know, like a 70 to 300 5.6 lens oh, nice. yeah. <laughs> trying to find focus and uh, and you're shooting and it's going off at like one tenth of a second and then uh, <laughs> you put on your flash and it's like a sun pack flash and then all of a sudden it just lights up the whole chapel like a nuclear holocaust as the next photograph <laughs> and everything's white. So uh, that was an absolute disaster. But uh, <laughs> the, the other stuff was passable, I would say. Oh, that's good. And they liked the photos then. They still classed you as a relative after that. I, I think so. Well, I got me 100 quid anyway and they didn't ask for it back. <laughs> that's that's always a plus you know if a client doesn't ask the money back that's a win, that's a win. <laughs> <laughs> it's still a win um but then so then how what did you do after that did you really realize from that this is what you wanted to do like you know full on did you go right for it straight away i think from what i've heard from other wedding photographers it kind of came at a time in my life when all my friends were getting married just my kind of 30s and late 20s and my brothers got married so they all just picked on me not because of my skills just because i would do it for free or (laughs) next to nothing so i got all those contracts so the first probably two or three years i was making zero money really making less than zero because sometimes you'd buy the fuckers an album and they wouldn't pay for it (laughs) just to protect their friendship but uh, it was it was a slow kind of learn, learning curve. There was n- nothing really available to me in the way of photography community or or like YouTube or anything back then. You just had to kind of figure it out from magazines. Mm. That must have been hard, man. What years? What years are we talking about then? What are these years? What? Um, I don't say about two thousand and maybe seven or something uh, like that okay yeah it's a long time ago. I, had, I had just been thrown out of america so i kind of found myself back in ireland yeah well that sounds like a story jay how are you 
<laughs> I was living there for a few years with no visa, and uh, oh, nice. I was kind of living the dream. I was surfing, living in Venice Beach, and nice. surfing every day. I was working in the skateboard industry, and um, eventually La Migra caught up on me and oh, wow. uh, gave me gave me my fond farewell back to Ireland. <laughs> <laughs> was it quite scary that i mean was it literally proper like you have to get out by this was, certain date i spent maybe two hours getting grilled in a police office oh, with that i remember just these two cops just shouting at me and asking me questions where i was living where i was working they had a big giant framed poster of george bush behind them at the time and i was like man this is the grimmest experience of my life and then they threw me out back to Dublin Airport. And then I had to sort of begin a whole new life. But I'll tell you a great thing. And this is kind of how the universe kind of conspired for me. About two weeks after I was thrown out of America, I met my wife on the beach here in Donegal. And about a month after that, I randomly got a phone call from my sister-in-law's uncle who needed a right-hand man working for the local newspaper he needed somebody to do the real dog's work and I was like I've got a camera I have no money so I kind of that kind of helped me begin my career as well oh it's meant to be then it's meant to be being chucked out of, of the US. <laughs> best thing I ever done <laughs> are you are you allowed to go back I was I was given a 10 year 10 year ban <laughs> and then they told me I could go for an interview, but it would be unlikely I'd be allowed back in again. That's what the guy said in the oh, embassy. Really? So, yeah. but I'm, I'm grand. <laughs> I've, uh, I've had plenty of America. Yes, that's cool. What, whilst you were there for a while, did you did you go to Vegas? I never went near Las Vegas. I never really had the the finance to uh, make that trip. Yeah. But I know that's your favorite. Your I know. Yeah, Las Vegas local. <laughs> I wish I wish I lived a tiny bit nearer, but yeah, I do love it. I love it. I need to visit outside America. Well, that's a cool story though, man. How you, you met your wife on the beach. Oh, that's really cool. And then so then you started working in the newspapers and were you doing weddings on the side then as well? I, I did a few weddings. I worked in the newspapers for two years, and that was say the lowest rung of the ladder in the newspaper world. And then I thought I would love to be like a photojournalist and work, be the main man in the newspaper. Mm -hmm. But I was doing a column in the news or a few pages in the weekly newspaper called It's My Party, which I don't know if anyone knows of such a thing. But that's you have to fill pages of drunk people in nightclubs. So you just go into the nightclubs, go into house parties and take photographs of groups, take all their names and give it to the newspaper for the next day. And the newspaper would print them and then try and sell them those prints to the public. Wow. So all for the the beautiful sum of £25 a night. Nice. Well, it sounds a little bit like wedding photography. A little bit. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was fairly grim, but it taught me so much how to go into really chaotic places and create some kind of order and be able to go up to drunk people and ask them, like, will you please stand over here and try and work with your flash in the, in the dark? So mm. it was fairly hectic, but it taught me so much. And I kind of knew back then that this is my kind of training. If I want to get somewhere, I have to do this for next to no money for a couple of years. And uh, good things will come from that. Well, they definitely did as well. Because, uh, yeah, I mean, proper rocket. So what, what kind of time did you go kind of like full time as in, in for, you know, wedding photography then? When was that? I'd say maybe 14 years ago or something like that. It was the 4th of July, oh, wow, 2000 you're... and something. I just remember that was the date. And I was like, wow, this is, I got thrown out of America and now I'm becoming a, a full-time wedding photographer on the 4th of July. Oh, yeah. Independence Good crack. That's <laughs> mad, isn't it? What, so that was the date where you kind of quit your other jobs and, yeah. Uh, that's the time I... Uh, I registered as a full-time photographer. Uh, okay, cool. Did you were, were you scared then? Did you have a certain number of weddings booked in for the following year, so you felt a bit secure? But was it? I guess it's it's always scary when you do that kind of thing. It was scary because I didn't really know any other people that did it. I was fairly mm. isolated in that regard. I what I did do practically was go to the bank and ask them, "Can they cut my mortgage in half for a oh, right. year?" Which they did. 
That's which was good. a good relief. And I yeah. had about 20 weddings on the books and maybe three or 400 quid in the bank. So I was, I was fairly stable. Right, a bit squeaky bum time. Yeah, but... uh, big time. But that's good. You Sometimes you got to leap and, uh, and see what happens. I totally agree with that. So I was, I was similar, you know, when I went full time, my wife was like eight months pregnant with our first child. And that's so much crack. Hey, that is good. <laughs> I, but I'm like, you, you've just got to go for things. Sometimes the worst that can happen is that I would have had to get another job, you know, and you know, so you just got to go for it. I believe now. Yeah, that's true. You've mentioned oh. a couple of times that how you didn't really know many other photographers and stuff. Um, but so when when did that kind of change? Because now, obviously, you know everybody knows you. You're like like the most loved photographer. Like so, when did that change? I would say maybe it's it's different now in Ireland than it was. I can compare it to this. Maybe around six or seven years ago, I went over to the Fearless Conference in Hungary. Was it Hungary? Oh. Budapest. Oh, cool. And yeah. I went on my own and I remember meeting loads of the guys, you know, the kind of the Belgians and the Dutch have such a massive, amazing community mm. and they're such friendships. I remember thinking, I don't have this. What? How can I have this when I go back home? And I think after that there, we started to kind of nurture relationships and kind of go and meet people and attempt to bring a wee bit of that into my life anyway. I know lots of people knew each other, but I was fairly isolated up here in the very top of the country. And around that time, I had started learning to fly, which is our kind of wedding photography kind of community and retreat. Yeah, I was going to and ask from you. from that, I met a load of people. And, and that just kind of kept going. And right now, there are so many great friendships all around. And, the, and Ireland's a great place to be a wedding photographer in that regard because... It's very welcoming. There's lots of groups around there. There's what Doc Day's got going on. It's mm. really nurturing. There's there's our crew and there's lots of friends and they and they go out and they and they socialise together and they walk the hills and it's great to see you've got friends in every county in the land. Yeah, that's awesome, man, isn't it? It's very magical about what we do, I think. You know, when I began, like, back in 2012, and th I thought it was going to be so guarded and nobody wanted to, you know, get in touch because we'd steal each other's secrets and stuff. But it's just the opposite. Aye. It's such a lovely scene. Um, and you mentioned learning to fly there. Then I was, I was going to ask you about that. So, yeah, what was the – why did you start that? You know, was there a um, kind of catalyst at the time? Was it because you wanted to increase the community or, you know, what – why did you begin that at that time? I have, I can recall going to a big conference that people have been talking about for years. You gotta go here. There's lots of speakers and there's classes. And I finally had the money to go and I went over. And it was, for me, my experience was, it's just like a trade show and people kind of trying to sell you stuff. And I thought this was going to kind of be a catalyst for me to just, inspire me to grow my business and I thought you know what I'm going to do I'm going to attempt to do something here in Donegal and invite three or four wedding photographers that I either half know or know of and see what happens and it was just a workshop and I had no idea what was going to happen and we hired a kind of hotel function room and a few houses by the coast not the only thing I had in place was like four talks from professionals, yoga and outdoor shoots. And beyond that, the people kind of created it, what it became, which is what it became a retreat and a place for people to gather and escape the world. And originally for me, it was just going to be, you know, like pure education mm. and photographing for portfolio and stuff. And it just became what it naturally organically meant to be because we're in the most beautiful coastline of the world and the sunrises and the sunsets are just sublime. Um, I'll tell you a funny story. My good friend, Paul O'Hara, who was to me in Ireland as wedding photography royalty, she is just the queen and her work is just divine. And for me, she was a hero and I'd met her once and I nervously tried to speak to her. And then I just emailed her out of the blue, telling her my plans. And she kind of turned me down. 
And then I emailed her again, and I think it was the, fir- the fourth time she finally said yes. And I was like, she's going to think I'm just some maniac. But eventually <laughs> she, she said yes, and she came on board, and then I knew, right, we've got something. And I invited a few other guys. And then it, it, it just took off, and the years the years passed, and it got better and better, and people began to find out and want to come. That's so cool, man. Something that you've created like that. It's so magic. And I've only heard just amazing things about it. Um, yeah, it's awesome. Was that first year, though? It must have been scary. They're initially trying to think, oh, I need to sell a certain amount of number of tickets to maybe even break even. Was that scary? Uh, it it was scary. It was mm. scary, all right. We had 12 people came. Um, I think I made, I didn't lose any money. I That's made about mm. 90 quid. <laughs> and that was grand. Sure, what else could a man want is have that experience plus 90 in your pocket. <laughs> and it was grand. People seemed to have a good time. It was a bit all over the place with uh, with me trying to organize people and people unsure. But uh, it was grand. People, I realized what people enjoyed and what they reacted to. And mm. the, the, the very fact, maybe you probably see this yourself, that people love to gather together and have conversation every bit as much as they do listen to educators. Mm, that's so true. Mm. No, it's so cool, man. And is it so with all your things, does everybody, do they, everybody kind of live together at the same kind of accommodation over those few days as well? A wee small village called Kuldaf, which is right on the coast. And that's a wee dreamy village. There's three pubs and about 10 houses. And there's a family run hotel called McGrory's which is the place that hosts it. And everybody either stays there or various wee cottages in the village. And we just kind of take over because the village is dead in the winter. And for those three days, it's alive with people and crack and booze and traditional music. We do a lot of, it's become more of a, not more, but like we've kind of lent more towards the kind of wellness side and the community-based kind of social sites. We do a lot of yoga. We swim in the sea. We uh, do breath work. And we do lots of group activities. And then your main speakers maybe take an hour or two here and there. But um, it's kind of just organically became that and not through much control of mine. Just sounds great, man. Honestly, it just sounds great. And you've got one coming up in October. It, it's sold out, though, isn't it? Is it sold out? I was looking at the website. Uh, it's sold out fairly quick. We've got two man studios coming, so that was a massive one, and um, it generally kind of sells out fairly quick. We we can only take maybe maybe thirty or thirty five people, so um, we've got two man coming up from Canada, and which is I don't know if you know know have any experience with this. You just email somebody and say hello. You don't know who I am, and you've probably never heard of us, but do you fancy coming to Ireland? How much would you cost? And all of a sudden, you get an email back. Yes, we would be interested. And you're like, what? How did that happen? That's These so guys cool. surely are the most craved wedding photographer educators, and they're coming to our wee tiny village in Donegal. Oh, it's because of what you've created, though, man. It's because of what you've created. Uh, uh, but you also have to chance your arm as well. I we guess have, so. Um, yeah. We have Peter Carville as well and Annie Kafesh, who I know is a good friend of yours. Oh, and yeah. awesome. my good buddy, Richie, Rich Gilligan, who's a kind of documentary and commercial photographer, which is a nice wee kind of escape from weddings. He'll do a talk and uh, tell us about his life. Oh, it all sounds grand, man. I've got to come over one year. You've got to keep doing it so I, I could come over. I'd lo- I really would love to do that. It'd be awesome. There's and if- room in the bed for you anytime. <laughs> awesome. Um, and if people are listening now, you know, if they're interested in maybe next year's or whatnot, can you tell them wh- what do they get? Do you have a mailing list people can go on so they could, you know, find out? You can find us on Instagram, Learning to Fly, or we have a Facebook group which is fairly active called The Tay Hut on facebook so find us there it's um and and just join the crack and join the conversation and um next year we'll we'll create something equally good i hope 
Awesome. Yeah. And I'll include um, links to that from if people go to this reptage.com to this um, podcast post, I'll include links through to those as well. Yeah. Awesome, 2024 man. with guest speaker, Alan Law. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I would love to come over though one day, man. Honestly, I would love that. It'd be so cool. It's so cool. Although I don't know about the sea swimming, as I say, you know, I need to get a proper, a proper yeah. wetsuit that fits. Bring you your go? auntie's wetsuit. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Okay. Okay, man. Uh, Jay, let, let's change tack. And you have heard quite a few episodes, I think. So you you know about the little quiz that I do. I do. It's my biggest fear in life. <laughs> do, do you watch uh, much TV or movies? I don't. I don't. I know <laughs> nothing about TV or actors, but I will certainly give it a try. Okay, that's what we like. That's what we like. That's that's, that's <laughs> cool. So, if anyone's listening for the first time, just a little quiz we've been doing over the last like seventy or so episodes, I think. Um, I'm just going to say a movie or a series synopsis, and we're going to see if Jay can get the title. Um, hopefully, you're enjoying playing at home. So cool. Uh, I've got these are all quite old movies for you today, Jay. Good man. Yeah. Okay, so your first one. Okay, let's go. This is old. It's about. Whoa, 30 years old or 25 years old? It's pretty old. Okay, so. The mysterious Catherine Trammell, played by Sharon Stone, a beautiful crime novelist, becomes a suspect when she is linked to the brutal death of a rock star. Investigated by homicide detective Nick Curran, Catherine seduces him into an intense relationship. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> I know what Sharon Stone is, but I... I couldn't even guess. This is going to be a disaster. Zero out of ten is coming. Uh, I'll, give, I'll give you a clue. It had like no, a No, don't, don't. I still don't know. No, okay. okay. I'll just say it. I'll just say it then. So uh, it's Basic Instinct. Basic Instinct. Oh, right. Very yeah. good. I remember, I remember that back in the day. Oh, I man. may. I'm yeah. Totally embarrass myself here. <laughs> no, this is all good. A lot of most people get zero out of zero, out of three. So it's all good, Jay. It's all good. <laughs> okay. So it's only three. That's not too bad. <laughs> yeah, it's only three. It's okay. Okay. So your second one, this again is old. It's about 20 years old. Okay. So Ted, a geek, attempts to track down his high school sweetheart, Mary, and hires a private detective to know her whereabouts. He soon realizes that he has to compete with others in order to impress her. Man, my you should see what's inside my brain right now is just like <laughs> like tumbleweed going through the streets. Um, I don't know, weird science. I have no oh, idea. weird science is a good shout, though. I remember that. That was that was good. Yeah, Kelly LeBrock. Yeah, that was a good film. That's right. What a dream. <laughs> oh, that no, so that is um, there's something about Mary. There's something about Mary. Oh, very, right, very good. Good man. Yeah. I haven't seen that in years. That was one of the first DVDs I ever bought, I think. That and The Exorcist. But anyway. Okay. So this third one, I've included this third one now. It's not very well known, but it's a, it's a skateboarding film. So thought with your skateboarding links, you might know it. Okay. So, it. Okay. So a California skateboarder, played by Christian Slater, solves... You mean the cube? Yes. There we go. Oh, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> that's good man one out of three is good you know i've never seen I, it is I it good seen that about 600 times oh that's cool man good i uh, put that one in there for you oh that's cool is it good, a decent man. thanks for the <laughs> thanks for the charity <laughs> that's old isn't it is it like early 90s or something that's old it's something like that our video shop used to have it on rent so uh, we would just rent it out all the time oh classic day i remember video shop days i used to work in one when i was like 15 and stuff oh wow well, yeah I've got me and the wife were talking about that lately and we were telling our daughter, you used to go down on a Friday night and buy your popcorn and brews. It was just such a like a social part of the, the whole film. Mm, it's true, isn't it? I remember also like before I worked there, I used to wait in the video shop for like some like sometimes seven or eight hours. Like like if like Karate Kid was on telly the day before, then you'd go down to the video shop and try and get Karate Kid two, but it was always someone was had right. it out and you'd you'd wait. I'd literally wait there for like eight hours because they couldn't reserve it. And but anyway. <laughs> like, um, <laughs> um, let's go let's go back to your photography, Jay. Um oh, and please one, do quick. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> one of your specific reportage awards which is awesome is something i've never seen before and since i think and it seems to be the couple what well, looks like they're entering the wedding breakfast on motorbike is it it looks like okay, that yeah eh? it's yeah. like a honda 50 moped that's so cool it's such a great capture with such an awesome sense of movement um yeah can you tell us more about that that was his father's moped when he was young and he used to take his wife for dates on that 
Oh, wow. And then uh, his father gave it to the groom. And uh, and he told me the plan. And I was like, man, best idea I've ever heard. So they just, they had it out in the storeroom. And you know when they call the bride and groom in with the wedding party in to get their evening meal and everyone's cheering. So all the bridal, the bridal party came down. And then everything went silent. And they put on like ACDC Thunderstruck. <laughs> and you just hear the revving of the moped. And he just like drove over the carpet and through all the guests. <laughs> and uh, I had sunglasses in the van and I, I ran out and gave him sunglasses. I said, wear them so it'll be even more dangerous if <laughs> you're driving around in the dark. And uh, I was good crack. I remember I, I shot it in a slow shutter. I shot yeah. a few safe ones at the start and then I kind of ran up and I turned it on to the slow shutter with a flash. And it was great crack. I see them guys from time to time, and we always reminisce about uh, about what they did. But I, I've only seen it once myself. Yeah, it's not something we see numerous times. I think. Oh, that's so cool, man! It's so cool. I love to hear that story. It's cool how it's proper sentimental as well, Ben, and personal. Oh, that's your bike. That's so cool. Do you feel you know when you know something? Um, unique is going to happen at a wedding you know obviously every wedding is unique but you know it's something like that and you know going in on the motorbike is very different do you feel kind of extra pressure at that time to get a really good shot of it you know i'm just wondering how you feel in those kind of situations i can imagine all right because it's uh, fairly important maybe something like we're going to visit my granny in an old folks home or mm. what, what actually what happened there on saturday's wedding now, I'll take you off on a tangent. That's good. We like tangents. It's good. They had a bottle of champagne, you know, like Dom Perignon, the real expensive mm. stuff. Mm. They had been given that by a friend who had passed away a couple of years ago. Yeah. And he was really special. And I think he died fairly suddenly. And he had said, or maybe he didn't because he knew to give him that. Open this on your wedding day and have a drink with all the friends because they all worked in a pub. So there was maybe after their speeches, they went outside. It was fucking raining, by the way, which I thought was even better because that's just like it kind of suited the mood. Mm. So there's maybe 10 of them gathered with this bottle and they got glasses and they made a wee speech and they opened it up and kind of everyone was crying. I was crying like a child. <laughs> I had a fairly long lane, so it was kind of back out of the way. And then the bridesmaid gave her a card that he had written yeah. for a wedding day and they, they read it out. Oh, my God. That was heavy. But that was a beautiful thing to be part of. But by God, I, I was uh, I was sheet white after that. I was like, oh, my God. But again, what a what a, a privilege to be part of. And mm. her cameras have silent shutter, which is an absolute godsend and such situations and they and they all started hugging and crying and I kind of I kind of floated off back into the reception and let them at it but uh crazy oh man yeah we do see some we do see a lot of stuff don't we we do do you often get emotional at weddings I do I do I'm uh since my dad since my daughter was born it kind of opened the floodgates to the tears that I've been holding <laughs> maybe for all my life. And I I cry. They do a thing over here called the daddy-daughter first dance, if you've heard of such a thing. Mm, I kinda, get it very occasional, not very often, but occasionally. Uh, it happens here fairly often. And there's two or three different songs. And when they announce it, it's usually a couple of songs after the first dance. I'm like... Oh fuck! Here goes again. How am I going to get over this here? And um, they uh, they do it, and I all I think about is me. Will I be able to do that with my daughter? Imagine that will be as good as life gets. But my legs would turn to jelly, and I wouldn't be able to dance with her. I wouldn't be able to walk her down the aisle. I would be too banjaxed with emotion. Oh man, yeah, I feel like that. It's like the same, same, same with you. I think when my daughter was born, like eleven years ago, it did change things. And yeah, I think of myself now at weddings. Yeah, I mean, you know, when I'm photographing weddings, in maybe twenty years time, if I'm going to be lucky enough to be giving yeah. my daughter away or being able to oh, do a speech, wow. and it's mad, isn't it? Yeah, it, that, I think it, that daughter it, dance is lovely. I wish it was more often in England. It's not very often. 
Uh, it's kind, it happens in rural Ireland. It's it's a beautiful thing. But um, do you imagine you could do a like a speech for your daughter? Oh you no, man! No, no. <laughs> bottom lips, dirty quiver. I would be. I would. I would totally be in tears. I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> I can't even imagine what I'd say. Um, I know. Oh man. Yeah, it's mad. It's like obviously everybody's everybody is totally different. So not judging anyone at all now. But I just feel like I, often I photograph a lot of you know when the bri- the dad is seeing the bride for the first time and the dress and and I, I have to say oftentimes the the dad looks almost like disinterested. Is like he's just not bothered. And I I just think whoa, it's oh I just when it's I, when I'm doing it I'm just going to be in floods. I think I totally get you that. I think a lot of the time maybe that's. In the bride's mind, that's going to be bigger than what the dad's thinking. The dad's just wanting to get the hell out of the house. And he's worried about the priest. And she's like, oh, I can't wait. But uh, I guess we can tell these wee kind of fib stories that, like, out of all that sequence of your dad walking into the room, maybe out of the 30 shots, there's three that he's kind of looking like he's down for the cause. And that's yeah. the one she sees. <laughs> that is true, isn't it? That is true. Uh, we do control the kind of narrative that way. Even if we're not physically controlling the scene and what's going on, we do, in a way, by the images that we choose to keep and show. It's true. Uh, that's right. The power. Power. <laughs> oh, But yeah, anyway, it made me thinking of like, but... Yeah, maybe my daughter won't get married and she'll just stay living with me for the next, you know, 50 years or something. That'll be okay. (laughs) She'll be safe at the homestead. My daughter's (laughs) actually just away on holidays. It's her first holiday on her own. She's away with her friend, her friend's family. So a fairly emotional morning. uh, I slipped her some money on the way out the door and gave her a few hugs. So she's away for five days and we're uh, just waiting by the telephone to hear the crack. Oh, yeah, that's hard. Uh, How how old's your Uh, daughter? 13. 13. Oh, yeah. Oh. Are they going abroad or is it in Ireland? Or? They're going to a place, Centre Parks, that's kind of like, kind of like Butlin's kind of oh, holiday yeah. camp. I love Centre Long. Parks. I love Centre uh, Parks. I've yeah. never been. We've been to Euro Camp a good few times, but um, uh, she's so looking forward to it and there's so much action. Oh, yeah. She'll have a brilliant time. Love it there. Love it. My, It's funny enough, my, I um, took my daughter today. She's starting secondary school in September and they're having like this kind of what's called a summer challenge week where they just go into school and do some fun things. But I took her there this morning oh, and right. that was emotional, though, because loads of people who were coming along, they all knew each other. They're in groups and she's she's not okay. coming from a feeder school, so she doesn't know anyone. And I just felt so sorry for her, my heart going out to her, you know. It's oh, like, man. You yeah. you would probably walk in with her if you could. I'd sit beside yes. you. Dad yeah. And... <laughs> oh man. Oh, she would be very embarrassed by that. But I embarrass uh, her all the time anyway. But it's all good. It's all good. <laughs> uh, it is. That's true, isn't it? It's true. Um, Jay, let's. Um, you mentioned Doc Day. I was going to mention it as well. And you've spoken at every Doc Day so far, and always bring so much fun, energy, and warmth, man. Um, do you enjoy presenting? You look like you do. And will you be speaking at Doc Day four? Probably not. And I said that about everyone and I ended up there, but I, I don't think. But I I do enjoy it once I get into it. No doubt, like yourself, the kind of hours beforehand are just fairly hellish. Mm. And you find yourself sitting in the toilet fairly often. But I, I do enjoy it. And when you're getting, I Oops. did a fair bit of public speaking. And we used to go to, if you've ever heard of Toastmasters, Oh, like yes. yeah. you learn to do public speaking and stuff. And I went to that a few times before learning to fly just to kind of learn. And I, I I read that book, Talk Like Ted, which is the kind of TEDx kind of book, which was great, a great education. And then I did a lot of talks around camera clubs just to kind of learn that kind of art form because I knew I had a few talks coming up and uh, I got fairly good at not cursing so much and not humming and hand so much. And, but the first two or three talks I did, ju- I just did them with A4 sheets of notes in my hand with a shaky hand <laughs> and trying to look at the audience. You know, like when you're when you're reading at mass and when you're reading at chapel, you look up every two minutes and then your head's back in the paper. It's uh, <laughs> like doing a wedding. I, I, do, I do love it. And when you realize that maybe people are – when you kind of speak your own truth and it's you're not trying to educate people, you're not trying to lecture them, you're just telling stories and telling 
realities from the field. Mm-hmm. That's a great kind of time that uh, people can see. Listen, this maybe you remember back in the day when any of the speakers you would have seen at the conferences were the gods, and everything that they said was was just Bible, and and they were flawless. But I think it's totally different now. You can just go up and ramble and tell stories and tell people they hold on that there's there's hope for everybody and um, tell people that their lives matter and and shit like that there and it's really that makes it a whole lot easier and you don't really have to consult your notes you just ramble and talk and people laugh and then mm. you realize you didn't even stick to your script at all <laughs> i think people as you say i think people just really appreciate seeing genuine just genuine people up there i think that just goes <laughs> so far and you know when you when you talk you're just yourself your awesome self and just people love that and you're so entertaining man as well i still love the double jumper joke from the first doc (laughs) day it's just kind of nervous energy and you're like i have no idea what i'm going to say next and madness just comes out from deep within (laughs) i remember your talk was very good remember you kind of had interviewed yourself oh yeah thank you it was a good it was good crack it was a good concept oh thank you man i love the way you all had you have your little notes at the bottom of the slide (laughs) but that's not even a joke that's mainly because i don't know how to work the you know the kind of whatever evernote or whatever people use you've got your notes in one page that people can't see i don't i don't know how to work that thing so i just (laughs) write them really lightly at the bottom corner for reference only <laughs> oh it's just perfect it's so good oh man if anyone has not seen jay talk you really have to it's awesome and um hopefully you will be making it four in a row in uh next year it would be awesome man so i would love i would love to just sit there and enjoy it without that that That's anxiety true. remember yeah. the last one not last year the year before and the other venue in dublin and there was a wee kind of green room down the back oh, i don't remember and actually. i um I just lay there in a yoga mat on and off with <laughs> bouts of anxiety going, oh, shit, because there was proper big time. There always is, but the people that are, that are, you know, so loved around the world speaking, and you're like, mm. what am I going to say? And they're putting me on at the very end. So I, <laughs> when I was, I was lying there trying to do yoga and trying to breathe, and then, and then I just went for a walk around Dublin during one of the speakers on my own, and I ended up in, a, in an iron sweater shop and I bought another iron sweater, which is where that joke came from. Because <laughs> I had two iron sweaters. So I was like, right, fuck it. I'll try that and see if people enjoy it. Well, they definitely did, man. They loved it so much. People want you back all the time. So, yeah, it's so cool, man. It's so cool. It's interesting for me hearing, you know, that you are human and that you get nervous as well, though. Because when you, you just seem such a confident you know, person all round. I'm just quite surprised that you say you're nervous. I mean, it's good to hear that you are. you do, but... Yeah, I mean, do you get nervous shooting weddings as well? I can't just can't imagine you do. I do, surely. There's there's always that kind of nervous panic that drives everything. That kind of probably drives me to overwork and drives me to kind of try and really impress people. So kind of maybe I harness that kind of nervous energy in a good way. I'm not just sitting there like a victim, mm. panicking. I'm kind of like, well, make it work, and get in there, but um. Generally, before a wedding, I pull into the side of the road for a bit of a walk and a bit of breathing and a pee, no doubt, at the side of the head. Oh, yeah. That's what I always do as well. (laughs) Down a country lane all the time. And um, (laughs) I've got a song that I always play on my speakers just before I go into the bride's house. And that's uh, nobody ever knew about it, but I told my wife about it maybe about a month ago. Did you know I always listen to this song for about the last three years? before I walk in the door and it just levels me and it kind of inspires me and she was laughing she's like how I never knew that and every time now I just whatsapp her the wee link to the YouTube song so she knows I'm walking into the house then oh, and there. that's nice what song is it what song do you know the movie Nacho Libre it's with uh, Jack Black he's a, a Mexican wrestler all oh, right no I think I've heard so, of it but no I've not oh, seen it it's like a comedy version of kind of Rocky Balboa. And um, before he goes into the ring to fight the 10 best wrestlers, 
It's a song by Beck called Ten Thousand Pesos. <laughs> and it's it's just an acoustic a song. And I always put it on and it just brings me to a, a more positive place. I can't oh. believe I'm sitting talking about this of all things. Oh, that's great. I think maybe like wedding photographers all over the world are going to try listening to that now. <laughs> <laughs> And he does a wee talk. The song's called 10,000 Pesos. And he does this wee talk. I will win 10,000 pesos for the orphans. So he's trying to support this orphanage. And I always message the wife, telling her I'm going in to make 10,000 pesos <laughs> for the family. Oh, that's cool. Oh, that's a cool leg. That's nice. That's nice. Um, and as you mentioned that, as I was before going into kind of like the bride's home, maybe, which we often start with, I read that you often bring a bottle of champagne to every bride's house in the morning. Do you still do that? I do it. I, uh, I'll tell you a funny story. About three years ago, I had a new accountant. And as part of my expenses, I tried to... <laughs> I tried to put down for 80 bottles of Prosecco and he was like, no way are you writing that off as a tax thing. But Could I you like, not? No. <laughs> but I bring that to the bride. Yeah, that's an I expense. Usually bring, I usually buy two bottles of Prosecco, one to bring for a gift and then one to bring when we're out with the bridal party so we can pop it open and like a Formula One. But um, right. I think it's a great way to enter a home. I don't bring my cameras. I just walk in and shake everybody's hand and give over a bottle of champagne and start making conversation. And then I bring in my camera maybe 15 minutes later. That's so lovely. Yeah, that's such a good idea as well. And just, it must, yeah, that's so nice. And what you write, because I, I think what you read, I'm sorry, what you wrote to, when I read about you doing that champagne was you were talking about kindness in, in general, really. And now it just goes such a long, long way. And I just, yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. Not just in wedding photography, but life in general, really. Well, it's such a big thing. I, a wee bit, a wee bit, I try and put a bit of positivity out there if I can. I know uh, I am but a sinner, but I think <laughs> maybe when you throw out a bit of goodness in the world, it feels good, but it also comes back on you a wee bit from time to time. And uh, it's a good way to kind of live and it's a good way to kind of teach your children, listen, offer people help or or extend a friendly hand from time to time and and bring someone into your community or uh, or bring a few wee treats I, I guess a family in a wedding morning are nervous the mum doesn't know what you're going to photograph she's got the house wallpapered you can smell the paint when you're walking in <laughs> what do you mean what they've re-wallpapered for the, that for the always morning. happens you walk in the the lawn is all mowed and the, the houses are done up to perfection uh, yeah. and um, the place is all dusted and you're, it's nice to walk in with a gift and say, I'm here to bring the goodness. I'm not here to take anything from you. I'm not here. I don't demand anything. I, I'm just relax and enjoy, I guess. And it, it makes the photos easier then once people kind of put their guard down a wee bit. Yeah, of course, totally. Yeah, I think that's a really lovely thing, man. Really lovely. I did. I also. I think I also read that. Do you often like print out some kind of like family photos and send them to the parents or something soon after the wedding? Right. I do that. I kind of. I have to confess, I stopped it about three weeks ago when okay. I'm. I'm just so busy. I'll yeah. start it again, maybe in a few weeks' time. But just over the last month, I realised. There's a few of these things that I do that I kind of have to stop just to survive July and August. So yeah. I kind of stopped that, which is, it kind of breaks my heart. But uh, I, I've been doing it for the last maybe three years. I bought a, do you know, like a die sub printer, you know, like one of those event printers. Oh, that, right. Okay. That shoot the pictures of one of those. And maybe a week after the wedding, I just print out the family photos and maybe like six like eight by 12 pictures and and write a wee note to the mum and dad thanks a million for your hospitality and your kindness and i had a brilliant time at your daughter's wedding and here's some pictures for the house and it's the greatest thing you get such feedback and they write you letters back and and the brides and grooms are so happy that you do it and it's nothing it's 10 minutes work for me and and it, it gets me out of the house i walk down to the house I walk down to the post office and I uh, post them out. And it's just like, how often do you get something nice in the post? Like, never. Yeah, that's so true. Mm. 
That's so nice, man. Again, I just think something which, you know, I've never ever thought of doing. I think the vast majority of people listening would not have thought of doing it. It's just so nice. It's just so nice. Ah, just make me feel like this bad, this bad, <laughs> bad man. <laughs> uh, no, you're a great man and you're a great character, sir. And you oh. put so much goodness into the world. You have, you have brought the happiness with you wherever you go. And you've inspired plenty, so uh, you're one of the great people. Oh, that's super kind, man. That's really lovely. Really lovely of you. Um, um, Jay, let's go on, because I know you have lots of stories to tell, which is great. And, and one of them I read again about, uh, I just thought it'd be good if you could say it on the podcast. So, yeah, can you tell us a story about a time you you needed a wee towards the end of bridal prep and something a bit <laughs> out of the ordinary happened? Right. Good man. I'm glad you brought that up. <laughs> I am. Um, I see that bride from time to time, and I see her dad. And every time we just meet, we're like shaking our heads. <laughs> so, um, just before we left for the chapel in the morning, and everyone was getting into the wedding cars, and you know you might not get to the toilet now for two hours. So I said, "Give me a wee second and I just ran in, and it, it was in the very northwest of Ireland. You know where Malin Head is? That's basically the, the most northerly part of Ireland. Okay. And it was all windy and rainy. And I ran in and I locked the door. And then when I finished my pee, I broke the key in the door. <laughs> and there was, and then I was like, oh, fuck, what am I going to do? And everyone was in the cars and they were all about to leave. <laughs> and then I tried to get out the window. And the window was like a really small gap. It was like 10 inches. And I was kind of got stuck trying to come out. Oh, and I was kind of stuck halfway out with my chest. And I was like, trying to shout, oh, help. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody could hear me. And then I got back into the toilet. And I was shouting through the keyhole. Like, how ridiculous is that? Shouting through <laughs> the keyhole. Like, and everyone on the other side, of, like outside in the wedding cars. And eventually somebody came in. And it was a bride's dad. Asking me what's going on, and I was like, I'm stuck in here, the keys broke, I I can't get out. And he goes, Okay, stand back. And he, he just started kicking the door and he kicked a big hole in the door. I just saw his foot coming through the door like uh like in the shining or something. It was like you know one of those old, really flimsy doors with the the kind of cardboard insulation. Oh uh, yeah. And he just kept kicking and he made a hole for me to crawl out. And I sort of crawled out and said, Thanks a million. And um, and then we went on, and I was like, this, so kind of embarrassed, this. but so in a world of kind of laughter for the rest of the day. <laughs> yeah. And the the bride's dad took a photograph of me through the hole. Oh, awesome. so I'm kind of waving out through the hole in the door at him, and then we just had to go then into a, like a big ceremony of four hundred people in the chapel. Wow. Ten minutes later, so I didn't have much time to dwell, but uh. Oh. I could crack. So now if I ever go to a wedding house and in the morning, I don't even close the door. If I'm going for a pee, I just stand <laughs> there and people walking past. I'm like so paranoid. Oh, man, that is such a great story. It brings me almost in cold sweats listening to it. But it's an awesome story. That's so cool. Uh, they, the parents saw the funny side and they thought that was great because the dad was a real Irish character. They, did, they didn't invoice you for the damage done to the door there. You, you didn't know do what? It. You didn't do it. I told them I would buy them a new door. Oh. I didn't. <laughs> when I drive past their house, I've got a wee pang of guilt of, can I Can I still drive up to their house with a door and just say, listen, there's that door from five years ago, by the way. <laughs> oh, that's funny. I want to see that photo of, yeah, of you. Ah, I just said it. It's good crack. Yeah. <laughs> oh i love that i love stories like that jay i love it have you got any more kind of like nightmare stories squeaky bum stories or anything that's gone wrong have you ever made any kind of like big mistake or anything you missed anything uh it's not so much fun but i missed uh, somehow misplaced family photos you know just after the ceremony just the family lineups and i misplaced them i have no idea it was back when i I used to use, you know, a series of smaller SD cards. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. And they, were, they were CF cards back then. Oh, right. Mm-hmm. And for different parts of the day. And somehow the family photos went missing. Oh, but they were know. grand about it. And I got screen grabs from the videographer. Oh, and they that's were, clever. They were dead on for the album. They were like six by four size. Oh, and it was all kind of saved then. But uh, 
Oh, that must have been awful when you realised that. Though, oh, it was hectic, yeah. man. I was kind of sick for a few days, kind of <laughs> wondering how are they going to react when I tell them. Yeah. And um, now I've got a kind of times like that have kind of created the system that I use now is you get your photos backed up as soon as you can and you use double cards for everything and mm. the second you go home you put all your photos onto a second hard drive and you edit as quick as you can and get them onto the cloud so everything's there like and no no none of your memory cards ever get formatted before the final photos are there and they're out with the bride and groom they they sit on the shelf before they're used. That is all really good advice. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I think people enjoy hearing stuff like that. Like, like you shit yourself when you hear things like that happen, even though that wasn't the end of the day. But um, you know you can do something to kind of mitigate it. Mm, that's true. Oh, but man, yeah, it is. Uh, again, makes you get little cold sweats, honestly. I get little cold sweats hearing stuff like that. Um uh, uh, well, but anyway, but it's, it does lead us to do good systems like that to uh, mitigate things. Yeah. Well. Uh, that's true. It's true. Um, you mentioned earlier, Jay, as well, that you uh, you doing yoga and that you, you teach it as well, don't you? So, yeah, just one. How, how did you get into it and what are the benefits from doing it? Because I've never done it. I would like to. I'm the most unsupple person in the world. But... <laughs> good man. <laughs> um, well, give it a go because there's stuff that you can do for yourself every day that's not particularly traditional yoga but just a bit of stretching and breathing that makes a massive difference to your mind and to your body we um we get into yoga through surfing and there was like a one of our surf friends wife was a yoga teacher and she did surf yoga so i kind of started doing that about 12 or 13 years ago and through skateboarding injuries i kind of needed it and my body reacted well to it and then um I just always did it and about five or six years ago I had an opportunity randomly to to learn to be a yoga teacher and get my certificate. So um, I'm a qualified Hatha yoga teacher uh, but I kind of just made up my own style of yoga after that. I kind of, once you learn the basics you're like right, here's stuff that I think people really love and it's kind of maybe a a gentle side of yoga and maybe some spirituality and good kind of mindfulness and reminding people that their lives matter and stuff. It's a great, you have a great opportunity. I teach it in the, in the winter time when I don't have so many weddings. Wow. Oh, that's super cool. That's cool. Um, do you, is it something you do? Do you do like every day as part of your kind of like routine? I, 10 minutes in the morning is just a stretch and breathe. I put on, maybe one Sigur Ross song, which are usually about eight or nine minutes. And that oh, just yes. takes, me through, takes me through like a flow yoga. And it's just standing on the mat in your bare feet and moving and breathing. And it's a great positive start to your day. And it's, it's not difficult and you don't have to be standing on your head, just moving and breathing and being a human and allowing your mind to settle before you begin your day. I can definitely see the appeal. I should try. It. I should try it. I should try it. I should try it. Um, it's just the funny. The two bands that you've mentioned. Well, you mentioned Beck and Segura Ross. I saw them on the same bill. They supported Radiohead in Oxford, so I saw them on the same. Did bill. you? Yeah. yeah. I would That's love fun. to see Beck. Yeah, Beck it was is, fun. Uh, mm. I did. Uh, I did a talk in Belfast for photographers, and I used Beck Loser for my slideshow. Oh, cool! Yeah. It was uh, it was all the photos that I'd fucked up that year. It was just <laughs> like a slideshow of out of focus and overexposed and absolute disaster photos. Oh, that's it's awesome! Just, the soundtrack was loser, and I was like, <laughs> oh, it's good crack. I couldn't do a slideshow like that because it'd be about twenty hours long. I think. <laughs> I know. <laughs> but I think people liked it because they realised, wait a minute, this guy's human. He's not kind of out there creating good stuff. The good stuff kind of comes amidst the the small disasters that is so true yes totally 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 um let's go i've just got so many bits to ask you about um jay time's going away but um one of your special projects has been um wedding grannies which i love to hear about before but but for anyone who hasn't maybe heard about that can you tell us um, more about that good man it's um i had two books out wedding grannies and wedding grannies volume two I've, I've got oh, uh, cool. a few other books, but that, that's the Wedding Grannies one. 
Um, in this part of the world, and I would imagine all around, maybe everywhere, the granny is in the family is kind of held with a massive esteem. And she's just roy- royalty, I think. And you see it at weddings when they announce, oh, granny's coming, granny's coming for a visit in the morning and everyone's so excited. And the granny kind of gets helped in and, and and it's just a beautiful thing to see. So I had so many photos of grannies and I don't have a granny. I have no granny. So I, I'm like so into getting cuddles and all. And and like, wow, this is amazing because I, I didn't, when my grannies died, I was in my late teens or 20s and I didn't really sort of realize how much good a granny can have in your life. So uh, I always had that loss, but uh, I had so many granny photographs. I was like, right, I had an exhibition. And then uh, I thought, fuck it, I'll make a book. And um, we got a load of books printed. And uh, I sent them out to all the brides that whose granny was in them. And then I sold a few extra ones. Oh. But it's a good thing. It's a good thing. People people love it. And uh, I enjoy it. And I enjoy the wee cuddles with the grannies. <laughs> that's such a cool super cool thing to have done as well it's so lovely that you sent copies to all the brides whose grannies were featured and yeah it's so special what was the exhibition like where did where did you do that i tried a few art a few art halls in the area a few um to try and get a proper exhibition and they were like they were wondering who the hell it was and <laughs> in, in the local city near me and they were like oh, the concept was just kind of, no, we don't do wedding stuff. And then I thought this was a, I came to this realization, like people, regular people on the street need to see this, but regular people in the street don't go into art galleries really. So I just went into the village here in Muff and I asked the coffee shop, can I use that big wall for this exhibition? And it was brilliant because everybody saw it and everybody could just walk into the street and they didn't have to be in any way associated with the art world. It was just like the regular guy in the street and a lot of the grannies from around this part of the world go into that coffee shop so they could see themselves printed and framed in the wall. So it was brilliant. It was really good fun. That is really cool. That's so cool. I just love it. Love it. Um, I'll include people listening now as well because you've got kind of blog posts, haven't you, on your website with the, the grannies on? I have grannies yeah. up in there deep somewhere. I can link people to that again. So, yeah, that's all cool. That's that's really cool. Again, such a cool thing that you've done. You've done so many awesome things, man. It's so cool. <laughs> <Let's>... <laughs> yeah, man, life is short. You've got to go out there and just make things happen and enjoy what you can because uh, God knows, like, that's fairly finite, so you have to you have to love it. So true. That's so true. Let's do some um, let's do some quick fire ones. We've done an hour, but have you got a bit more time? Because I'm really enjoying. I'm it. here, right? Good man. Let's go. Cool. Okay, okay, Jay. Let's do some semi quick fire. They don't have to be quick fire, but you know, let's just yeah. I've got got a lot of questions. I just want to hear from you, so it's all good. Okay, so do you prefer sleeping or eating? I like both. I like, <laughs> you've got to choose one you got to i can if i can get a good night's sleep that's the greatest gift if i can get eight hours uninterrupted sleep there is no better thing it is a beautiful thing isn't it it is a beautiful oh thing. wow that's true do you i do you go to bed early late maybe 11 something like that okay um we have a caravan by the coast and you when you're in your bed you can hear the waves from the sea and I sleep like a dead man down there, like nine, ten hours sometimes. And that's uh, that's all I want out of life. Is that a, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a sleep. is that a good answer? <laughs> it's a great answer. I know a lot of people say, well, you can sleep when you're dead. But sleeping is one of the biggest um, enjoyments in life, I think. I love it. So yeah. I like eating. My wife's a vegan, so we eat good, kind of exciting dishes. So uh, okay. um, I like yeah. both you're not you're not a mcdonald's super fan then i would eat a big mac i would eat it maybe once every three or four years i i enjoyed burger king there used to be a burger king oh, no. in a town but that's a um, swear word that's a swear word man i know wait, i'm talking to the wrong guy. <laughs> um, yeah i don't know man Grim it's enough, okay. and Peter McDonald's would be fairly grim, I would reckon. <laughs> you don't want to hear that. <laughs> okay, look, swiftly on, moving swiftly on. Um, when was the last time you left your phone at home? Um, 
fairly often. I yeah. would avoid them away, not to have it much to the frustration of my wife and my family. Daddy, why didn't you answer us? But when I'm kinda going out for a ramble in the hills or going for a swim or going out with my skateboard, I try and leave it as home as often as I can, just just so you can properly escape and you can um you can free your mind because it's always there. It's always kind of shouting at you from your pocket. Yeah. Hey, we're in here. Talk to us. <laughs> it's so true that. And it's lovely to hear someone who does leave their phone at home. Honestly, and I, I asked that on purpose with you because I, I thought that you were going to say you did leave it at home a lot. And I think that's awesome. Um, and that, I just never do. I have to say I never, ever, ever leave it. And I really should do. My, my family have made up an expression called doing a J, which is kind of a derogatory thing. It's like <laughs> when you're when you won't answer their phone calls for like three hours, it's called doing a J. Oh, okay. And they, <laughs> and they think I'm doing it on purpose, but I'm like, I just don't have my phone. Yeah, you're enjoying life. You're out there enjoying <laughs> life. That is so cool. Um, what? Okay, it's quite a big question, this, but uh, what does it mean to be successful to you? What is success to you? There's a, I'll I'll take you off on a, a different story. There's a singer called Glenn Hansard. You know him. He's from oh, the Free from Once. Oh, he's in the film. Uh, Once as same well. guy. Yeah. I, mm-hmm. I I watched an interview with him, and he said success is freedom to do whatever the fuck you want. And I have that written in my office wall. And I, I thought that just sums it up for me. Like, yeah. what do we get to do? We get to work in a job that we absolutely love. We have loads of free time with our families. We get to meet loads and loads of people. We get paid fairly well. Freedom to do whatever the fuck you want. And that's yeah. kind of what I do in life. And I don't take it for granted. Yeah, I think that's yeah, that's such a great answer, man. That's so yeah, that's so true. We are so lucky, aren't we? I mean, we are so fortunate. It's about before Doc Day, maybe the first year, I made a wee tiny video that I went back to my old job for a day, and it just documented what I had to go through in my own job, which was a delivery man delivering bags of cement around housing estates. Wow, of course. And uh, I videoed the whole day just to show people, listen, <laughs> this is the real world. This is what I used to get paid, a fraction of what I get paid to do right now. So I went back and tasted it, and I came home absolutely banjaxed and really wrecked and having made very little money. And uh, that's what you know, 90% of the planet are subjected to all the time. Yeah. And uh, look what we get to do. That's so true. It's so true. And... And yeah, it's so easy to take things for granted, isn't it? It's so difficult not to uh, for a, a lot of the time. But I would yeah. imagine you you feel the goodness. Like, you're a happy fella. Like, I would say you know you're in a good place. Oh, totally. Yes, totally, totally, totally. Yeah, Every, uh, yeah, big time. Big time. I used to have to do horrible, like, kind of conference calls with cold businesses and stuff. And, oh, oh I, man. Just remember that kind of thing. I'm like, wow, I don't care how many weddings I've got to edit or call. This is all good. This is good. You, yeah. I heard. What was your old business that you used to write love songs for people? Oh, yes, I did used to do that. that I enjoyed <laughs> yeah. that. <laughs> I, uh, I was watching an interview with you the other day. That was part of my thing. I kind of <laughs> preparation for this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to watch an interview with this guy oh, just thanks. to see the back. And that was one of the first things. And I thought, Man, that is the best. That is such, that's a guy going for it there. And that is such an amazing thing. <laughs> it was fun. Didn't make much money, but I enjoyed <laughs> it, you know. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Okay, Jay, let's go. Um, what, what, if anything, are you afraid of? What are you afraid of? I guess the usual stuff, just ill health or your family, your family being in any pain, your children not not being happy simple stuff we get there yes no that is that's very true yeah that's very true everything changes doesn't it once you have children in your family your own fears become it's, well they're not really it's all about other people the fears are about other people um i kind of stuff that you can't control sometimes but um i guess when you realize if you know if you're sitting around the kitchen table and 
we're eating together and people are laughing from time to time. Even the wife would kind of look at each other and go, just nod your heads as if this is as good as it gets because it's so simple and everybody's happy and then everybody's in a good place. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, it's been so, I mean, honestly so fun talking to you. I could ask any every question that I've got here, but oh, I get credit. It's, it's, this is this is not prepared. You're just no. throwing things at me, and I'm like, right, I'll give you some crazy answer. That's the but, beauty uh, of it. I could be back. What's uh, Jay? I've got, what's a random fact about you that you think most people will be surprised to know? Random fact. Let me see. <laughs> On on my wedding day, this just come out of my head here. On my <laughs> wedding day, we had a camper van, like this old thing from the nineteen eighties, and that was my surprise for my wife for a wedding. Wow. I bought this Bedford Bambi, and uh, it broke down in the wedding morning, and we had to push start it about fifteen times just to get to the wedding, and it kept stopping, and then it ended up driving in first gear for about an hour. <laughs> just to get there we went about eight miles an hour and then i was late for my own wedding my oh, hands wow. were totally covered in oil and muck and i was sweating but a uh, random fact i don't know if that's that is a very good one yeah that's great <laughs> late for your own wedding that's funny how late were you oh maybe a few minutes but uh that's but that was good crack everybody was there and uh it was it the wind was howling and the rain was beating down and it was proper uh, Proper good Irish wedding weather. Oh, so who was your photographer? Were you were you into you were doing photography then when you got married? I was. My photographer oh. was Leo Sharp from Cornwall. He from Cornwall, really, really. He That's a way. And what? he was the British skateboard photographer all my life when we were growing up. He was the main man, and uh, I was looking for a wedding photographer. And a friend says Leo does weddings now, and I was like, no way. And I messaged him and. Leo and his wife Kirsty came across from Cornwall and uh, we went surfing for a few days and then he photographed and it was brilliant. He did um, a lot of photographs on these kind of square format Hasselblad and digital stuff and it, it, it was just brilliant. He, he was an absolute dream and it, plus being my hero, oh. it was it was just one of the best things. That's really cool. Yeah, that's wow. Small world as well. Because I'm yeah. You say you lived in Truro. I'm literally like five minutes from Truro. Is that that's? I I send a wee message to both of you because I know you guys will be good friends and he's Aww. a great fella. That'd be awesome. That's so cool. Did you um, did you skateboard on your wedding? Did you? you know? I did. We had a half pipe outside oh, well. our wedding reception. You did, so did me you? And wife, <laughs> me and the wife both. We had a few wee runs on the skateboard ramp. She had a. Uh, so cool. Knee pads on below her wedding dress, like we, you know, like rainbow knee pads from the seventies, <gasps> and uh, we did some tricks together. So I was, it was great crack. We have a massive photograph of it on our living room wall. That is awesome. That is so cool. That's so cool. I um, do right. Okay, I am. I am gonna. I'm gonna end it because I could talk for hours, but I just love talking to you, man. We've got time for one more question, if that's okay. Yeah, hit me up. Okay, let's do it. So, yes, so Jay, skateboarding, sea swimming, camper van adventuring with your family, you seem to have the work-life balance conundrum totally sorted, it seems to me. I know you're super busy, but you also seem to be just enjoying life. So, yeah, what are your thoughts on the, like that work-life balance, you know, which is something that so many of us people listening maybe kind of struggle with? I would say a lot of people in this world do. Mm. I think more so would you would you agree in the videographer world because those guys seem to be so snowed under with editing uh, and yeah. backlogs. I do feel for them. I think we get it a wee bit easier. But um maybe like a lot of people I'm using AI software to to do eighty percent of my editing, which, oh, yep. oh, yep. which oh. allows for a, a whole lot of a better lifestyle, especially in the middle of wedding season, like I have no backlog, all my editing's done. I'll finish Saturday's wedding this evening. We'll oh, be wow. done with a slideshow. Um, it's so important. I know in this age that it's a time of kind of, for a lot of people, of anxiety and a lot of fears, and the walls seem to be squeezing us. And it's difficult to kind of find, find your peace and find your calm, but... 
I think it's really worth paying a big amount of attention to your well-being and your health and the people that that you have in your community and the people you surround yourself with. For many reasons, like you'll be a better photographer, you'll be a better at your business, but you'll be a happier person and, and you'll live a healthy, a long and healthy life. We have the potential to be living the dream without a doubt. And um, I think a few kind of small adjustments in our lifestyle and our attitudes kind of can go a long way. Mm. So true. That one, I remember you recommended some books at Doc Day. I read, um, was it The Gap and the Gain? I thought that was that was a really fab book. That was inspirational. It was Gap a great recommendation. It's excellent. It's one of the, the, you know, like there's a few books in your life that you read that make a massive difference. But that's, an, I'm reading at the minute a book called Unreasonable Hospitality, which is, um, which is excellent. It's like one of those books you read every few years that you just, you know, you have to take notes when you're reading. It's like, this will change my life. Man, it's that's... just, it's in the, it's, or, go ahead, sorry. Oh, sorry. It's a, it's a total small world because someone messaged me on uh, Instagram yesterday saying that they were reading that book. That's Is that right? Yeah. A friend really? of mine just recommended it. And I've been, anytime I'm driving, I just listen to it on Audible. And it's, uh, I always end up on the hard shoulder making notes because it's, <laughs> There's just so many amazing wee nuggets of, of kind of help. But it's it's written from the point of view of a guy in the hospitality industry who was like a restaurateur and just how he treats his uh treats his clients and uh and and his kind of his community around him is just so good. And it's usually we small things that make the massive impact. Uh -huh. Like um what does he do? When, when someone comes into his restaurant, he asks them where they're parking so we can go and feed some quarters, you know, like in New York, into their machine. Oh, wow. Like, his staff do that for people. And they, it doesn't cost anything, but it just makes such a massive impact to people's experience. Mm. Well, that's like you doing, the bringing in the champagne and doing the prints and, you know, everything you do. And you've been, you just naturally do that kind of stuff, man. It's so cool true but um the person mentioned that book to me as well because uh, there's a tv series called the bear have you heard of it the bear no any uh, good it's so good and it's it's set in a restaurant in in like chicago and stuff and apparently it's to it's semi-based up or, or, on that book or something that's right yeah so it's really good i really recommend it it's excellent but small world yeah that's uh, anyway small world i will definitely check that book out as i say i loved your last recommendation so yeah i'll, I'll definitely do it and dude honestly thank you so much for talking to me today i knew it was going to be great you're just so so awesome to talk to so inspirational you really are it's so awesome everything you do and yeah just thank you loved it good man i enjoyed the crack you're one of the you're one of the great characters i always enjoy seeing your big smiley head <laughs> this is my head is uh yeah has no hair on it so i guess it's quite it's a shining <laughs> shining thing <laughs> good man oh uh, anyway listening now do head to this reportage.com i'll include links to to jay's site the i'll include the image the reportage already spoke about uh links to the, his uh, wedding grannies and learning to fly as well which uh, you know i've always just heard amazing things from it i hope to go along um someday and <laughs> Yeah, man. If um, I don't see you beforehand, I'll, 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 if you're not talking, I imagine you're still going to be at Doc Day, aren't you, next year? I'll be there. Good man. I'll look forward to seeing you. I will really look forward to seeing you as well. I need to, like, you always, I never see you in the evening. I need to, like, have a drink and chat more. I never get to talk to you. <laughs> I know. We generally uh, skip the, the drinking part. Oh, yeah. I need to talk to you earlier in the day. I'm going to make an effort and reach out, man, and find you in the day. You can do it. We, we're, like five hours drive away so um we make it that we leave at four in the morning to get down there and then leave about seven o'clock and get back home about midnight uh, okay yeah you should stay stay the night stay party with us no you don't want to see that beast at all man <laughs> well dude man thank you so much for chatting to me today uh all the best for the rest of the season and uh, yeah i'll see you uh, uh doc day next year good man alan cheers bye bye You've been listening to the 137th episode of the This Is Reportage podcast. Absolutely love chatting to Jay. Hope you enjoyed listening in. 
Head to thisisreportage.com for a link through to his website to see the Fab Reportage Award he spoke about, a link through to Learning to Fly, where you can grab a ticket for 2024, and to hear the song he always listens to before weddings as well. As mentioned on the intro, Jay is now also speaking at Doc Day on February 20th, 2024. Head to docday.international to grab a ticket and see him in the flesh. Always an experience. TIR members get an exclusive discount as well. Check the members area for the discount code. We now have 137 episodes of the podcast available where we speak to wedding and family photographers from all over the world. If you like this episode, delve into our back catalogue for lots more. If you're not a member of the Shepardage or the Shepardage family, check out all the benefits of joining us, including an unlimited number of images on your profile, 60 individual award and 18 story award entries per year, invites to our physical meetups and parties, exclusive discounts, hours of educational videos featuring tips and advice from some of the world's best photographers, and much more. There's just days left to enter our first collection of 2024. The deadline is the same for both sites. Submit by 2359 GMT on the 24th of January 2024. No poses, nothing staged. This is Reportage. And this is bye for now. <laughs>